Hello and welcome to everyone out there in the actual tech media audience. Thanks so much for joining us on the event today. Happy Friday. We've got a great webinar lined up for you. Um, the topic of today is sharing hybrid cloud success stories. We'll also be providing an update on Veeam version 12. This is going to be a great event. A special thanks to our friends over at Veeam for making this event possible. Before we get started, there's a few things that you should know about the webinar. Uh, my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as the host and moderator. We always want these events to be educational, and we encourage your questions there in the questions pane of the audience console. I see many of you out there saying, hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are across the United States and around the world. Uh, we love to see that. We appreciate that. Uh, but we also want your technical questions on the topic of the day. So keep those questions coming throughout, and we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. We even have a best question prize today to help maybe uh, shake some questions loose. Uh, I'll talk about that more here in just a moment. But first, I want to call your attention there to the Handouts tab. There are three links you'll want to check out. Uh, the first one is the free Hybrid Cloud Backup for Dummies ebook. You can download that right there. There's also the number one Hybrid Cloud Backup Guide and then the Cloud Protection Trends Report for 2023. Uh, you wanna make sure you click on those links now, uh, grab those, and you can check those resources out after the event. At the end of the webinar today, it'll be my pleasure to announce the winner of our Amazon $250 gift card. If you're watching this recorded, of course, that drawing would have already occurred. Uh, the prize terms and conditions can be found uh, right there in the handouts tab of your audience console. And then, as I mentioned, we also have a best question prize for an additional $50 Amazon gift card. That means you have to ask a question to be entered into the prize drawing, and we'll be selecting and contacting that prize winner after the event. Um, you, of course, still must meet the prize terms and conditions. All right, good info, but it's time to kick off today's event. I'm excited now to welcome our two expert presenters, Welcome to Sam Nichols, who is a Director for Public Cloud Product Marketing at Veeam, and Leah Troshinecki, who is a Principal Product Marketing, Marketing Manager for Public Cloud at Veeam. Sam and Leah, it's great to have you on. Take it away. I'll hand it off to you. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for that warm introduction, David, and uh, joining us today. Uh, this is my third actual tech media event in like I don't know, seven days, and I can see my usual fellow Wisconsin contingent. So hello to all you guys. I woke up to a few inches of snow that I had to shovel this morning. Yay. But uh, we got onto more fun things right now, which is talking about uh, some of our hybrid cloud success stories and some of our latest releases from Veeam that's evolved within the V12 platform. Um, before we do get started with that, I would just like everyone to know that Leah and I have prepared some slides for you, but we absolutely like to keep this as interactive as possible. So any questions, comments, concerns, requests, airing of grievances that you might have, feel free to post those in the questions panel. We'll keep our eye on that throughout and really just make it so you guys steer the content that we have today. So Leah, I know that you want to talk to us about some hybrid cloud realities and where we are today. Yeah, so take care. absolutely. So Veeam is really fortunate that we have a very healthy um, culture of research. Uh, we really want to better understand not only market trends, but what is really changing within the way that organizations are considering backup and recovery. So one of those pieces of research is called our Data Protection Trends Report for 2023. And one of the main questions that tends to come out of that research each year is what is the mix of your environment across virtual, physical, and cloud hosting? And prior to COVID, uh, you know, we really saw a healthy one third, one third, one third. So a third of all servers were hosted as a physical infrastructure, a third were hosted in virtualization, and a further third were in the cloud. Um, but of course, I'm sure everybody on the line is all too familiar with all of the challenges that came with COVID, whether it was supply chain related or the need to be able to burst and scale for net new services. You know, healthcare comes to mind. I have a lot of customer conversations over the last few years of the ways that they've needed to rapidly burst into the cloud in order to meet these brand new demands. 
and simply trying to get a hold of physical servers um, for on-premises environments was just difficult. And so now that we've sort of seen the settle of, of the dust, so to speak, and we're taking a look at what these environments look like now, nearly half of all data is hosted in cloud environments for these organizations. And this is a survey done that is not specific to Veeam customers. We work with a third party organization and this year was the biggest one yet. We surveyed 4,200 organizations, specifically IT leaders um, as the persona. So to just hear the sheer scale of that, I mean, if you look at this data, you can see that in 2020, the mix was 32% hosted in the cloud. And by this year, that's, you know, a 20 plus point jump. That is tremendous. And so that introduces new challenges, right, Sam, that when we're thinking about backup and recovery and what that means for our organization from a governance and compliance perspective, from a resiliency perspective, it changes the game. And I think we need to spend some time talking about the differences in what that means for backup administrators, especially. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, everyone understands at this point in time, or almost everyone, that the workloads that you host within the public cloud are your responsibility. Sure, that provider will um, take care of the infrastructure. Sometimes they'll take care of the platform or the software itself. But that data that you host in the cloud is yours, and it's your responsibility to protect and secure that. And you know, what Leah was talking about is, is the nature of hybridity. There's very, very few organizations that uh, are still 100% sole source on physical machines, 100% sole source on virtualization, or even in the cloud. They're using a mixture of these environments, sometimes multiple clouds. And that's ultimately to take advantage of the different benefits each of these environments have to offer. You know, the cloud is, is great. Um, it's a, an instantaneous resource. We can spin up any number of hundreds of services almost instantly with a simple account and swipe of a credit card. Um, however, some of the workloads that are highly performant require kind of like millisecond latency. Um, maybe there's governance, compliance, sub, uh, data sovereignty rules still gives uh, the, the, the data center its place. Ultimately, we're living in this hybrid environment. Everything needs to be protected. But the way that you protect a physical machine is different to the way that you protect a virtual machine. That's what gave birth to Veeam 16 plus years ago. And the same holds true for the public cloud as well. We're dealing with um, infrastructure, sometimes platforms where we can't even see the underlying infrastructure. So we're forced to look at new, new data protection tools that are native to that platform, purpose built for that platform to give us best in class backup and recovery. But that introduces some challenges in and of itself, which are point products. Um, the average organization uses 3.4 backup tools to back up their heterogeneous environments, sometimes as much as seven. And that really is complex. It's inefficient. It's costly. Um, there's not feature parity between all of these tools. So what we see as part of um, as part of our data protection trends report and the cloud protection trends report, which is available in the handout, is folks are craving standardization to protect their on-premises data, IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS data. Uh, it's one throat to choke. Um, so they absolutely want the nativeness, the purpose built backup for each of their different environments, but they don't want that to come at the cost of the challenges of point products. So standardizing that under a single platform is massively desirable for these folks. Leah, anything you'd like to add around standardization, centralized management, don't say single pane of glass, it's a swear word, you'll have to put a dollar in the jar. <laughs> Yeah, I have no desire to uh, contribute that dollar to the jar. No, I, I think one of the other things that when we talk with customers comes up in conversation is around skilling and training. Um, so when we're thinking about you know changes to IT staffing, having to consider managing multiple different products that are purpose built for specific installations doesn't sound terribly appealing. So that's yet another reason that organizations are thinking, how can I reduce the risk in this effort to standardize um, and having to not manage different kinds of form factors, I think plays into that. Absolutely. So the next piece that we want to talk about is around data portability, right? Being able to move your data across infrastructures. 
the same data protection trends report shows that that is second to the standardization, right? The ability to move workloads from uh, on-premises into a cloud hosted environment, and sometimes even being able to move workloads from a cloud, one cloud to another. Uh, if, if you look at the, the origination of cloud hosted data, it's pretty much uh, uh, a third split across where this data originated, 33%, from um, physical ma uh, machines, 33% from virtualized machines, and 33% was born in the cloud. And because of where those workloads originated, we can infer and you know indefinitely from that that folks desire the ability to mobilize their data and move it from one platform for, to, to another. Again, on-premises into the public cloud, sometimes even from one cloud and utilizing a, a tool set, especially a fragmented point product tool set, really hinders that. Like none of these tools talk to one another. They don't even understand the existence. Um, so that, that becomes a challenge that hinders those transformative initiatives. And there's one other piece that I do want to, to call out, which is a bit antithetical to you know, these trends that we're seeing, everything moving into the cloud. It's stuff coming out of the cloud and moving back on premises. Um, over 50% of organizations have actually moved data from the cloud back on premises. That might be due to uh, like a disaster recovery scenario. I wouldn't say that that's especially surprising. You know, we fail over to the cloud, it runs there, I get my on-premises footprint back up and running and I move it back. But it's also the over rotation towards the cloud. The cloud is not a charity. Um, and it can become very, very expensive, especially for some types of high performance workloads or workloads that have a huge volume of data behind it. It's moved to the cloud. It doesn't necessarily meet the expectations that they had, and they subsequently moved it back. Uh, Leah, anything to add around mobility or being locked in or out of a specific platform? Yeah, I mean, again, when we chat with customers, we hear those sorts of stories of, this desire for portability. And it sounds very much like a messaging term. And that's really not what we're talking about here of, you know, some highfalutin language. This is real world scenarios of, you know, I was chatting with a, a healthcare customer of ours um, out of Arizona, and they were talking about, again, during COVID and needing to rapidly find elasticity, they refactored sort of some applications to move into Azure. Well, again, from fees, you know, that that bill shock is very real to something not working correctly on the latency front. There was a lot of reasons why it worked for the time period that it did, but then they needed to pull it back on premises and really get better control of the service that they were trying to provide. And it made sense to move that back to the on-premises environment. And Veeam was able to do that, uh, you know, by, by replicating the data, by pulling it back onto that on-premises environment, that portability becomes a very, um, big reality, but even knowing that it's there, even knowing that you have the opportunity to exfiltrate, I think just gives you more confidence of trying something in the cloud, of opening that opportunity to innovate without having quite as much risk of being locked in to that cloud installation. So these are a lot of the real world scenarios that we've been talking about. Yeah. And I think that the final one that we just want to cover is just controlling the cost of, I mean, I, there's backup on the slide, but really just controlling the entire cost of the cloud in and of itself. As I mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's not a charity. Uh, they are there to make money and there are hundreds of billions of dollars of companies for a reason. And that's because you, you ultimately pay for every ounce of compute, storage, networking, uh, API calls that you do in the cloud. And when that you know, when we start to think about that through a backup lens, we're ultimately dealing with copies of data, and that is going to consume compute to create those copies. Um, and then it is going to consume storage to store those copies. And maybe there's some API calls in there. Maybe it's being done across regions, and that includes like traffic or incurs traffic costs. But really, we want to almost have our cake and eat it when it comes to backup in the cloud. We want to be able to protect our data adequately to meet our RPOs and RTOs. We want to retain that data in line with uh, corporate mandates or governance and compliance that might be imposed by um, a regulatory body. 
but we don't want to blow out our budgets, right? We want to keep that cost as small as we possibly can. So we're not spending a lot of money on essentially insurance and free up those funds to pump into transformative initiatives, um, which is kind of what we'll talk about in a little bit. Anything to add around costs before we start talking about that, Leah? Yeah, one thing I'll, I'll call out, and again, if you go to the handouts and download that Cloud Protection Trends report, one of the survey requests that we had was around how long do you typically, on average, and again, every app is different, how long on average do you typically store a piece of data for long-term retention purposes, whether that's regulatory compliance or otherwise? And the breadth of answers that we had, I think was even shocking to some of us because it went anywhere from three days to a year. And thinking about what that means for cloud hosted data, that just balloons your costs, even when ultra low cost tiering storage is available from these cloud providers. So just being able to wrap your arms around it and only store data for as long as you absolutely need to, and then immediately deprecating that, I think that would be such a pipe dream for a lot of organizations and, and certainly something for us to talk about when we talk about Veeam. Absolutely. So, you know, instead of diving right into who Veeam is and what we do, I think the vast majority of you guys understand that now, you know, we've been around for almost two decades. I really wanted to talk about some of the successes, um, some of the organizations that utilize Veeam in a hybrid or multi-cloud footprint have been experiencing. And this first one is Hudson Bay Company. Uh, they are a holding company. They are one of the largest and oldest companies here in North America. Um, they're a holding company for things like Saks, Saks Fifth Avenue. Is that right, Leah? Is that a clothing store? Saks Fifth Avenue. So. Yep. And they have lots of offshoot I brands. Know. I, of course, can't really shop at Saks, but Fifth off Saks, I think, is one of the places. So that's more on my list. <laughs> okay. Well, as much as we'd like to talk about attire, we're talking about what, what, what these guys were doing with us. Um, so their challenge was, was ultimately to find a single solution to simplify and centralize the backup and recovery of, again, their on-premises footprint, but also their footprint in AWS and Microsoft Azure. Um, prior to Veeam, they were utilizing uh, a tool that I can't mention for on-premises, uh, as well as AWS backup itself and Azure backup for their for their cloud hosted workloads but again that was very fragmented fragmented they were using multiple products uh to, to cover these multiple environments none of them could see each other none of them could talk to each other none of them could send data to one another so again they turned to veeam to really uh, take advantage of the entire breadth of our platform right we can protect workloads on premises that are virtualized vSphere hyper-v RHV, AHV, um, physical workloads like Windows and Linux, as well as um, workstations, NAS, enterprise applications, and then a whole plethora of cloud workloads that come from uh, compute like Amazon EC2 and Azure VMs to PaaS like databases, RDS, Azure SQL, files, Amazon EFS. That's really kind of why they looked at Veeam. So they achieved using Veeam a single platform to simplify and centralize the data protection irrespective of where it resides. And that ultimately helped them to ensure better business continuity, but also something that I think a lot of folks overlook is like governance and compliance. They've only, they now only have one tool and essentially one person or one team, I should say, to now say, yes, all data is protected, accounted for in line with uh, compliance recommendations. And ultimately they were able to save more than a million dollars in one-time CapEx by utilizing Veeam and then uh, 600,000 in recurring OPEX annually. And I take, I put this quote from Ope, who is their chief technology officer, because I stole two of these words from this because I think it just, it, it summarizes it perfectly. One of the things that I love about Veeam is operational consistency, right? Again, it's not a bunch of different tools with different features uh, and technologies to learn. It's one tool, one throat to choke, and it applies to everything. Leah, any insights from you on this one? Yeah, I mean, we talked about staffing as a challenge, right? And so right there, operational consistency meets that sort of challenge of if I have a backup administrator who is tasked with being the person to call in the event that virtualization goes down, in the event that my Azure SQL database goes down, that that's amazing, right? That you have that sort of shared experience, that DNA across. Um, but the other thing that I 
think that it speaks to is confidence. I think that IT, whatever IT means, is this, you know, amorphous monster of different things that come together sort of sometimes when you squint. And those of us who are in IT, we know how the sausage is made, but those people outside of IT who we service don't understand really how the sausage is made. That's kind of why we all get phone calls about why is my internet not working today? So having the confidence that there's consistency in the experience across all of your infrastructures, that's a kind of sleep at night emotion that I, I hear a lot from Beam customers that we talk to. Um, and I really think it's possible because of the breadth of coverage across workloads. Um, but specifically not just the fact that we back up those workloads. It's the fact that we develop in a way that is consistent to the infrastructure it's being hosted on. Veeam really started as a specialist in virtualization. And those were the hearts and minds that we won. I remember 2007, we had uh, a launch of version seven, or I'm sorry, 2013, we had a launch of version seven. And the slogan for that was Veeam is for virtualization lovers. It's because people who lived, eat and breathed virtualization every day understood that Veeam was built for them. And now we're hearing that same kind of emotion for an Azure engineer an AWS architect, they take a look at the way that Veeam built and says, oh, this isn't a bolted on agent. You know, this is something that actually is considering networking and storage costs and understanding that we need to back up to a different region and to a different account. It's built for the cloud. And so I, I think that's where some of the confidence comes in. It's not just, oh, check mark. It, it really has that operational consistency with the thought in mind of what is uniquely needed for this infrastructure. You speak about internet troubles and who you'd call. Who would you call, Leah, if, if you had internet troubles? Well, I don't know because um, somebody on the call uh, was supposed to help me install a new mesh system to improve the internet experience of my very whole old historic home. And I, I don't think he's anywhere to be found right now. So. Well, that guy, I'm telling you. Lee and I have a great friendship. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Instead of talking about home network, and let's talk about some more customer stories. You so the first one really aligned with you. <laughs> yeah. Anything. Anything's game. So the first story with, with Hudson Bay Company really aligns well to the to the standardization. The next point that we wanted to, or, or we did discuss was the uh, portability and mobility of data across different uh, environments. And that's what, um, I'm ready to butcher this, Swa Navigable de France uh, really achieved with, with Veeam, right? So the use of, again, multiple backup and recovery solutions across multiple different locations with varying success rates was ultimately complex for them driving up costs. We've covered that. But what uh, one of the biggest things that they really utilize from Veeam was our ability to move data across environments as we discussed earlier. And that's because you know a migration is, is essentially just a planned failover with no fail back. You take a copy of the data, you convert it and instantiate it in this new environment. And that's what they're, they're doing, right? They they virtualize their physical servers using Veeam by taking a backup of their physical servers and just recovering it to vSphere. And they're doing the exact same with Azure as well. They're now taking their physical and virtual machines, taking that backup with the production fresh data and just recovering it in Azure and having that become their new production instance. So backup and recovery is, is yes, it's there for a reason to help protect and secure our data as part of any robust strategy, but there's a number of varying use cases that you can take using that production fresh data stored in that backup. And one of them's migration. You might use it for tef, uh, dev test even, uh, or, or maybe some, some analytics. Um, so there's a, there's a ton of different use cases, and that's huge about Veeam, is we use a common backup file format across everything. It's called the VBK. So whether we take a backup of a Windows machine or a Linux box, uh, a vSphere or Hyper-V VM, for instance, an Azure VM, a Compute Engine VM, it's always the same common file format that you can then recover in a different location. And that file format as well can always be read 
uh, even if you're no longer a customer of Veeam as well. So, you know, the, the portability is real. The ability to move that data anywhere you like um, is massive. And it's not just from a recovery perspective either, it's, it's from a backup, right? So we have a number of customers that are utilizing Veeam to take backups of their um, data center, of their edge environments and store that in the public cloud, either directly or through a tiered approach. We have other organizations that have AWS and Azure and they back up their AWS data into Azure and their Azure data into AWS. You know, there's no prescriptive approach from Veeam in terms of what you can or should do. It is like, here's the technology, here's a portable license that eliminates any sort of um, entitlement or procurement calls, support tickets, text, just have at it, go do it. The world is your oyster. Yeah, yeah I want to double click on that. Yeah, I, I want to double click on that licensing piece because I think that really speaks to Veeam putting our money where our mouth is. Because speaking on the, the product marketing side of things, we all would love to have business intelligence to say, is this license key being used for a VM or for Azure SQL databases, et cetera? Um, and that's why a lot of software companies have these extensive price lists that have all these individual license keys and all these individual purchases for different thingies. And I appreciate the need for business intelligence, but I think we really care so much about this story and our users' experience that having that portable license, a, a universal license file that can unlock entitlement for nearly any kind of infrastructure that you need to back up it obscures our ability to see what you're what you're using it for, but that's okay because as these workloads rapidly shift to the cloud, rapidly come out of the cloud, uh, maybe you decide to start by refactoring an app to Azure, but then you do a six month project to refactor it into a platform as a service um, offering from Azure. The license key can come with it. You don't need to go through all the procurement process and. When I talk with a lot of end users, that actually surprisingly comes up. And you wouldn't think licensing comes up in technical conversations, but licensing usually gets in the way of technical innovation. And so clearing those roadblocks just means that you have the keys in your hand to do what you need to do. And that's pretty great. Absolutely massive. All right, and the final one, we spoke about cost. So this is a great story from Best Friends Animal Society. Um, so these guys are all around saving and rehoming cats, dogs. Um, so they essentially had a, a data center with a co-location that they used as a backup target and a disaster recovery target. However, that was in an area prone to monsoons and flooding. Um, maybe not the best strategy for a disaster recovery location. Um, it didn't help them support the three, two, one rule, and it ultimately got very, very expensive. So they opted to use Veeam um, ultimately just to back up their data center into the public cloud. It's AWS in this instance, and the amount of capital that we save them, it's actually noted here. $42,000 um, a year was then being was then able to be reinvested into other initiatives. Um, so they actually used it to purchase a new data lake that was there for predictive analytics to ultimately, you know, improve the lives of these animals, rehome them faster. So, you know, these outcomes that backup can have really have a massive impact on the business downstream. Um, so I absolutely love this story. Uh, and again, they are using it for not just a backup target, but for disaster recovery as well. Leah, you're a dog lover. Don't you love this story? I do. It's made me smile the whole time. I love this success story. And <laughs> I really hope I get a chance to chat with Brent someday because I just think that their mission is so great. And I think, you know, that's one of the, the great things about talking about backup is we get to work across all verticals and across all different kinds of organizations and just being able to free them up to do more interesting things because backup just should be something that you get out of the way. Yes, there's things that we can talk about that are strategic about it, whether it's you know governance and compliance or cyber resiliency, but all of that adds up to, yeah, yeah, I wanna be able to fulfill the mission of my organization. And this is a perfect example of that. 
Agreed. So let's take a look at what's at the heart of all of what we've been talking about, and it's the Veeam Data Platform. Um, so we did do did go through a rebranding of uh, what we call our products and product lines in line with our V12 launch, which we're excited to talk to you about today. But it's really the, the same three things that are at the core of all of this. So secure backup and fast recovery, right? That is the Veeam Backup and Rep is or is Veeam Backup and Replication is our flagship product that was again initially developed to protect um, highly virtualized environments, but has scaled out to pretty much everything that you can see across the bottom here. So the cloud workloads, AWS, Azure, Google, any flavor of IaaS and PaaS there. Uh, of course, virtualized workloads, but also physical, right? You know, most backup vendors went from physical to virtual. We were like, no, we're sticking with virtualization only. And I think it took us, I don't know, almost 10 years to go, okay, like so many people want this awesome product to work with physical as well. Let's build it for physical too. Enterprise applications as well, um, Oracle Solaris, SAP HANA, and then your SaaS workloads as well, Microsoft 365, and most recently Salesforce. So that secure backup and recovery pertains to all of those. Um, they are all purpose-built for all of these environments, so they use custom integrations and APIs to really pull the um, varying you know, security technologies, uh, cost efficiencies of these platforms so we can have something that's purpose built. Again, we're not trying to take a square peg and fit it in a round hole. We then layer on top of that the proactive monitoring and al analytics. Okay, so we're, we're talking about the importance of centralized management, but monitoring, analytics, reporting is really kind of where we start to um, go into the day two operations of it, right? How is my environment running? Um, am I meeting my service level objectives? Where are areas for improvement? Um, so I can optimize for cost or performance. So the proactive monitoring analytics that comes with Veeam 1, again, scales across all of these. A lot of, these, uh, a lot of this is new with V12. And then finally is the proven recovery orchestration. This one's held close to my heart because I used to look after this product for Veeam um, five, six years ago. But the power that our recovery orchestrator has is incredible. It comes with a bunch of um, you know, out of the box scripts for common off the shelf soft, common off the shelf software to really take a complex um, three tiered application and make recovery as quick as quick as one click. And not only is that recovery easy, but the testing is fully automated, so we can run daily tests. So instead of calling everyone in the office and sitting around the table on a weekend with a lot of unhappy faces and running through things like DR tests, that is just fully taken care of overnight while folks are sleeping. And then we come to a document in the morning that fully documents the entirety of their test um, from was it successful or was it not, right down to individual areas where there might be a challenge or warning so we know what to go and fix. So that's that's really the core of the, the Veeam data platform. So let's take a look at what we delivered in V12 as it really pertains to the cloud. Leah, why don't you take us away? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we recently released a blog post that has a roll up of a lot of these. So if you want to see more information, whether that be, you know, uh, video demonstrations or uh, we put in a bunch of links to user guide articles of how to get started if you're a current Veeam user. Um, so we can certainly share more information. Uh, but this is a good roll up of all of the cloudy features and enhancements that came with this latest set of releases. And to be clear, these are releases across our core Veeam backup and replication console, as well as all of the ancillary solutions that come with that. So we have a monitoring and reporting tool, as Sam said, an orchestration tool. Um, we have purpose-built appliances for um, various technologies, whether that be AWS or Linux or whatever. So this is a massive release, and there was a tremendous amount that came with this latest set of enhancements. So to make sense of it and break it apart, um, we broke everything that we wanted to talk about here into two camps. So the first we're lovingly referring to as protect more. We could use a bunch of multi-syllabic words that sound very fancy, but I'd rather just get to the point. Uh, so the first feature that we're going to talk about is immutable backup for AWS and Azure. Um, so we do have these fantastic, as we've said, native solutions that backup and recover cloud-hosted data. And 
one of the amazing things that come ha has come out of that development cycle has been uh, these tremendous partnerships with AWS and Azure, um, specifically the product management teams. And I think they see a lot of value in partnering with third party vendors like Veeam who specialize in backup and trying to figure out how can we jointly come together to drive more value for our joint users. Um, so AWS, as an example, has a solution called S3 Object Lock, and it gives uh, organizations the ability to protect data in an immutable fashion. So in the event of something like a cybersecurity attack, you have a, your, a copy of your data hosted in a, an air-gapped fashion, write once, read many is, the, is what that phrase word mean, worm means, um, and that way it's protected and able to be recovered um, in the event of a cyber attack. So I think that's a really tremendous offering. And we've been able to provide that for solutions that we're backing up to AWS. So for example, if you were backing up a VM with Veeam, um, a few versions ago, you were able to back up into that AWS S3 object lock. What's new for this release is extending that immutable backup to AWS backups themselves. So let's say you're backing up an AWS EC2 instance, you can now back that up into that object lock um, repository. And now you can do the same for Azure because Azure now supports immutable storage for Azure Blob. Um, so there's a, a lot of opportunities for you to really build in cyber resiliency to your cloud hosted data. And I think that's something tremendous that organizations should be taking a look at. Um, but Google's not to be left out, right, Sam? No, no. Unfortunately, Google doesn't support immutability yet. Um, so we've just peeled for when they have the immutability option because we absolutely want to support that as well. But uh, there was a lot of great things to come with with Google Cloud. Um, so in the line of protect more, we also expanded our ability to cover more platform as a service workloads in Google Cloud to include PostgreSQL. Um, so in version three, which is the prior release, was MySQL. Version four that we have available today is PostgreSQL. So any kind of databases that you have there, we can protect that by ultimately staging, um, taking a snapshot and staging that on a server, and then taking an image-based backup and tearing that off onto uh, Google Cloud object storage. And while talking about Google Cloud object storage, one of the kind of ones that went a little bit under the radar as well was uh, nearline storage as well. So we now support three different tiers of object storage within Google Cloud. There's standard, then there's nearline, and then there's archive storage. So as those backups age and the likelihood of you needing to recover that data from an aging backup um, diminishes, you can tear them off on a time-based scenario off onto decreasing tiers of object storage. And the huge benefit that has is, is from a cost perspective, right? So anyone that has to retain data for, you know, really anything more than sometimes even 30 days, it, it, you have the benefit of putting that off onto, onto decreasing tiers of object storage. Now, the one, or well, there's two drawbacks, I guess, from that. Firstly is they are much less performant. So if you do need to do, perform a recovery, that is going to take a little bit longer. You also have to have, uh, pay data retrieval fees. But again, in an aging backup, like what's the likelihood of needing to recover a file or folder that is three years old? I'd much rather be paying, you know, for object storage that is fractions of a cent per gigabyte per month than, you know, five cents per gig per month for a snapshot. So um, some great new things that, that came with Google Cloud. Yeah, absolutely. And sort of in the vein of, of cloud stuff, we've talked a lot about app refactor and transformation on this call. Um, and we would be remiss then if we didn't talk about containers, because certainly that's been an emerging trend in infrastructure management. Um, we, Veeam acquired a company called Castin a few years ago. Um, and since then, we've been really fortunate to bring their cloud and container expertise into the fold. So with this latest release, we now offer centralized management of those Kubernetes backups backed by Kasten um, via the Veeam backup and replication console. So for power users of Veeam, for those backup admins who know that they're the one to call from somebody who doesn't know exactly who to call to say, hey, this thingy is down, uh, you now have the ability to centrally manage all of those backups in one console. So whether that be 
the AWS, Azure, and Google um, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service offerings that we just mentioned, or now containers across the you know, suite of storage types that they support, it really brings everything into that central plane of control, which I just think means, again, it increases that confidence. It brings that operational consistency that so many of our customers have been talking about with us over the last few years. Um, so that's some of the main things we wanted to talk about in the theme of protect more. I think the other way that we look at the cloud in the Veeam story is how can the cloud help us recover faster? Um, so whether that be uh, having a better storage type than tape, um, because tape you might have to pull out of Iron Mountain or in somebody's closet and you have to go get all that stuff, the cloud would be readily available. Um, and then also looking at the cloud for things like cyber resiliency. So we talked about immutable backups earlier. And in that vein, I, I want to talk about a function of Veeam Backup and Replication called Scale Out Backup Repositories. Um, released several versions ago, Veeam offers the ability to intelligently tier your backups to different levels of storage. So whether that be a capacity tier, that's the term within Scale Out Backup Repository that refers to your primary backup storage, or you want to tier that out to even as far as archive storage, it can all be automated within Scale Out Backup Repository. And what's new for this latest launch is you can turn on that immutable storage offering for Azure Blob within Scale Out Backup Repository. So you now have immutable backups of Azure VMs or for all your other things that might be in the data center, like Windows, VMware. It can now all tier out to Azure Blob and have that immutable storage lock on it so that it has all of the cyber resiliency baked in and gives you that intelligent recovery option. It's very cool, very sophisticated. Again, I really encourage you to go take a look at veeam.com. We have a lot of great demo videos to show what Scale Up Backup Repository can do. It's pretty cool. Awesome. Well, coming back to, to one of my favorites, which is orchestrated recovery. Um, so our Veeam Recovery Orchestrator as part of that platform also in, uh, got uh, some new cloudy features as well. And this feature is around orchestrated recovery to Microsoft Azure. So now anything that you build a recovery plan for can now be orchestrated through our direct restore functionality to Microsoft Azure. And again, this is going to be great for disaster recovery scenarios. It makes it literally as simple as one click, uh, including all the networking, but also equally valuable for things like dev test, uh, just plain old testing disaster recovery, as well as migration. So if you have you know, a complex multi-tiered application that you are looking to lift and shift into Azure, this is going to make that so much more simple. Yes, we have the technology for you to do it, and you can do it manually, or you can have it fully orchestrated and proven to work before you hit the go button. So this is absolutely huge, again, um, for Microsoft Azure right now. But the real value of Orchestrator is you can orchestrate pretty much anything. Um, I've seen people write scripts to post tweets to Twitter and then run them through Veeam Recovery Orchestrator. And there's, there's a good reason to do that, like service providers, right? Hey, something's gone down in the data center. Just automatically send out a tweet to let people know stuff's down and then another tweet to let them know that it's that it's back up and running again. So the, the world is your oyster in terms of, of what it can orchestrate. Um, I, I'm sure there's something that you could build it in with chat GPT, but uh, this one's out of the box now. <laughs> it's going to take us out of a job later, I swear, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to go back to the medical field and like, well, I'd have to go back to school, but yeah. <laughs> We'll find something. I'm sure somebody will think we're charming, completely charming, just like we are on this call. <laughs> um, so bringing it back to something that Sam mentioned, um, we have a tremendous ecosystem of service provider partners that we have worked with over the years. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier in the call that Veeam has a long history with VMware and with virtualization technology. Uh, one of the many benefits of VMware is they also have a tremendous ecosystem of cloud provider partners that run on VMware Cloud Director. So we have been innovating with VMware's R&D teams for many, many, many years now, um, specifically on a technology called Veeam Cloud Connect. It's baked into Veeam Backup and Replication. 
and it gives you the ability to send backups and replicas to these cloud providers. So, you know, I think Veeam Recovery Orchestrator is an amazing tool set for teams that want to build their own DR plans and really execute those effectively. For those that maybe don't have the time expertise on staff, offloading to a service provider is a really great way to meet compliance requirements um, without needing to take on a lot of that work yourself because DR is very hard. That's why we've built an entire tool set to support those efforts. But again, sometimes it's just nice to pay somebody to do it, especially when it feels like it's an insurance policy. So one of the new uh, parts of our latest release has been bringing our continuous data protection offering into Veeam Cloud Connect. So in an earlier version of Veeam Backup and Replication, we launched CDP, which gives you near zero RPOs and RTOs for mission critical applications. Um, that now is brought into the service provider fold. So for those looking for DR as a service for your mission critical applications, you can now do that with complete confidence and being able to fail over into an almost facsimile environment, VMware to VMware, um, which I think is very, very important, especially as we continue to think about what should be hosted in the data center. It may be those mission critical apps. And now you have a failover tool to execute that. But we'd be nothing without observability. So Sam, do you want to talk about Veeam One? Yeah, let's start bringing it home. Veeam One is, is such a powerful tool, again, within that Veeam data platform. And it's all around, again, observability, monitoring, reporting, analytics. We, we mentioned at the beginning of this call, one of the challenges in using multiple different tool sets is the lack of centralized management. But again, monitoring and then governance as well is huge. So Veeam One is bringing it all together. Yes, it's had the ability to do that for on-premises environments for a long, long time. But now we're bringing the same power of Veeam One to your AWS environments, to Microsoft Azure, to Google Cloud, and also to Microsoft 365. We just launched version seven of Microsoft 365. That can also take advantage of immutable copies to object storage, by the way, but also into the into the visibility piece. So, you know, are policies running as they should be? Are workloads protected? Are there unprotected workloads in my environment? Huge challenge within the cloud, right? You know, shadow IT. If I am a user, I could just go in and be like, create my own account, swipe my card, and I'm going to go and spin up a database or a virtual machine, and nobody knows about it. And then if there is, again, compliance requirements that mandates not only if that data should be protected, but how and for how long, and you've got no idea that it's there, that's a bit of a challenge. So Veeam One is also going to help with that. Um, a policy-based automation that's built within the products will also help capture that and apply a policy to it anyway the second it comes online. But that is, again, huge for, for users to, again, centralize the management, but also observability and monitoring. And there's actually three slides, three new features that we didn't make slides for Leah, but I really want to talk about them. Absolutely. So I'm going to. And you might have actually mentioned one of them already, but you know we've had this no notion of the scale out backup repository for a long time. It's the capability to build a uh, pool of storage that has a performance tier on premises. Maybe that's flash, maybe that's disk, but that's where your backups first land. And those are then tiered or copied off into the object storage that Leah was talking about. You know, so maybe there's a higher performance object storage like S3 or Azure Blob Hot. And as it ages, it goes off onto archive storage, S3 Glacier, Glacier Deep Archive, Azure Archive, Google Archive Storage. In V12, we did introduce the ability to go direct to object storage now as well. Now, there might be cases where you might want to do that for data sets in your data center. Um, sometimes we would advise using the scale up backup repository method so you have the freshest data as close to um, production as possible, so recovery is quick. But for edge use cases, so Lee and I, remote workers, you know, instead of sending that to a, a corporate data center, we could just send those backups directly into the public cloud. So that's feature number one. Feature number two that we didn't mention were the cloud integrated agents. So agents were something that we delivered. I mean, it must have been six years ago now for, again, Windows and Linux hosted workloads on premises. We've now optimized those by integrating them with specific cloud technologies. So they work for workloads that run in the cloud. 
Um, primarily that's the direct to object capability, but they can also run independently of any connectivity to VBR or not. Now, why this is important is for those of you that are taking common on-premises applications and lifting and shifting them to the cloud to run on a virtual machine in the cloud, just as they did on-premises, you can absolutely protect those with our native tooling. But sometimes, you know, you want the application aware processing and to be able to take advantage of all the goodness that the Veeam Explorers offer. So for instances like that, you can protect them with these new cloud integrated agents. And the best part is if you choose to do it with the integrated agents and the native tool set, it still only consumes one Veeam Universal license. So you can have your cake and eat it as well. So snapshot based recovery, using the native tool set, application aware processing, uh, and the Veeam Explorers with these new cloud integrated agents. And then the final one is for any service providers that are on the call as well. So we've had Veeam service provider console for what, that's probably about six or seven years now as well too, right, Leah? Something like that. Yep. Um, but the service provider console essentially was a remote monitoring and management tool set for our service providers or for enterprises that act as service providers to different departments within their organization to remotely monitor, manage, report, um, and then charge back or what's is, is charge chargebacks the enterprise term. What's the what's right. the service provider term? I can't remember. Billing. Billing. Thank you. <laughs> Guys, it's been a long week. It's Friday. <laughs> we are now bringing that goodness to AWS and Azure hosted workloads as well. So any service providers out there, enterprises acting like service providers that use our service provider console, you now have remote monitoring and management for um, AWS and Azure hosted workloads that are protected by Veeam with our native tool set as well. So those are three more cloudy things that I th thought was worth mentioning. Absolutely. All right. So that kind of rounds us up. Let's take a look at some questions. Leah, have you seen any that have come in? Lots of hellos. Well, I think sure. before we get to that, David was going to come on and talk a little bit about a potential prize opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to be announcing the prize here right after Q&A. Um, but we do have a lot of great questions. And I want to take this moment here to encourage everyone out there on the event. You know, If you have a question about Veeam, now is the time to get it in. We have two Veeam experts standing by ready to answer your questions. So don't forget about the best question prize as well. Um, I'll just start off with this question here for you, Leah. They're asking, um, you know, they say, I use AWS today. Is my organization able to send backups directly to AWS? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, there's a lot of use cases when you want to just back something up um, directly to the cloud. Like I'm thinking, for example, we were talking earlier about being remote workers. Um, what if you want to be able to back up a laptop? You don't necessarily want to worry about a storage device here because it's really an insurance policy at that point. Can I just send it to the cloud? And the answer is yes. With Veeam, you can actually back up directly to object storage um, with this latest release, which is, I think, a really exciting opportunity because I, there's a lot of times when, as a best practice, you should be backing up to a local media and then tearing out to object storage. Um, but having the option to decide that for yourself um, for the given workload or the given application, um, I think it just shows that, again, Veeam is one of the least prescriptive vendors on the market, um, and we want to keep it that way. Excellent. And what about this one for you, Sam? They're asking, how does the 321 rule apply to the cloud? Uh, this is a great question. Um, so for anyone that isn't familiar with the 321 rule, it's it's like a, a traditional way of backing up um, that's been long instantiated. Three different copies of your data, two different types of media, one off site. How do you do how do you do that in in the public cloud, especially for a cloud hosted workload? So my answer would be your three different copies would be your production copy, your snapshot and then something stored on, on object storage. So those are your three different copies, your two different types of media, your snapshot will be, oh, let's just say it's um, it's Azure, right? Your snapshot's gonna be stored on a managed disk. And then the other type of media would be object storage. One off site is where it starts to get interesting. So off site could be considered to be in a different region. Um, so maybe you're backing up US East to West, something like that. 
Or you could choose to do again what some of the customers are doing because of our portability piece, which is take that and then back it up to AWS or back it up to an on-premises data center. And then now you've got something off-site. So it's a really good question. Um, and we've kind of recently revised the 321 rule to 32110, where the last one is one copy that's immutable and the zero is zero failures, making sure that you test that and that you can recover because you don't want to find out in a real world scenario that you're unable to recover. Great question. Smart. Yeah, I like that. 32110, uh, the, new, the new zip code here for Veeam. I like it. Um, <laughs> another good question here. Um, there's always someone out there who brings this up, you know, what a, when we talk about cloud and that is, what about egress fees? Ah, Sam, you this is a great one? one, right? Yeah, yeah, it goes, it kind of goes nicely with what I was just talking about with 32110 as well. Um, egress fees are like death and taxes. They are unavoidable, right? Once you put, um, you know, data on a public cloud, that's how they make their money and they don't want it to go anywhere. Um, so you, there are instances where you're going to have to pay egress fees, but there are also certain things that you can do to get around it. Um, so one of the things that I would say is like utilize things like AWS Direct Connect, um, both in the cloud and then in your on-premises data center and use that as a dedicated channel. It will mean that you avoid egress fees if you choose to back up from the cloud to uh, an on-premises footprint and then send it off wherever. Um, so you will eliminate the egress fees there, but it, one of the things is traffic, right? So the cloud providers always, if, if you move data within region, they don't charge any networking fees. If you move data to a different region, that's when they start to charge for these traffic fees. So it will be deemed almost like a different region. So you're going to have to pay those traffic fees, but um, those are more palatable than the egress fees. So that's one way to do it. Got it. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, a lot of folks might not know there's a difference between the uh, inter, oh wait, inter region, right? Uh, versus yeah. egress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Um, interesting question here. Jeffrey wants to know, uh, have you seen a good graphic for the 32110? Uh, maybe I I'm wondering, is that in like the hybrid cloud backup for dummies book or one of these resources we have? There is a great graphic for it. I'm not 100% sure if it's in that resource or not. Um, okay. Leah, stall, stall for me, Leah, while I download the handout and look. <laughs> Tap dance, tap dance. No, we absolutely do have a good graphic for it. Um, I know for sure there's one on a veeam.com page. So if it's not in one of those handouts that Sam is feverishly looking at right now, uh, we will see if we can find that. And what's nice about having that sort of infographic available is that kind of rule of thumb is a, a lifestyle that we need to constantly be living, right? It's the same way that you get programmed um, from your cybersecurity team. I know here at Veeam, uh, the IT team most recently took over uh, our lock screens so that there's always some sort of Veeam branded thing that's programming at us. And whenever there's not an event going on or something that we need to be rallying around, oftentimes it's some sort of reminder from the cybersecurity team about something that we're doing wrong, clicking the wrong kinds of emails and whatnot. Uh, so the 32110 rule is a nice rule of thumb, not only from an architecture and design perspective, but to actually be living and breathing every day in your data management. So having that kind of thing handy that hopefully Sam is finding as I've been vamping, uh, uh, would be the fantastic. Funny, <laughs> the, fun, the funny thing is, is I wrote that number one guide and I don't know the answer. So really just keep digging this hole for myself. But um, it's not in there, but I found a link. I'm just trying to find the question. Where is it? And I can reply. Yep. Okay, Jeffrey. Uh, Adam How do I uh, posted a link here helping us out. I've got a link as well. I'll respond there to Jeffrey with that link and, and share it with everyone. I see you doing that as well, Sam. Thank you. Um, Leo, what about this other question? Can Veeam back up Google Cloud Compute Engine? And I just realized we're reaching the top of the hour here. So just about out of time, but what about backing up uh, GCE? Yeah, absolutely. So on Veeam.com, yes, we do. And on Veeam.com, um, on each one of the solution pages that we talk about each of these clouds, we have a, a list of all of the services that we support. 
Um, so if you're thinking, hey, does does Beam back up the specific thingy uh, that I use, the specific service, go to Beam.com and that will always be on there. And that's where a lot of our latest release is come from, is trying to build more and more support for these services. So hearing feedback really helps us try to prioritize with R&D and figure out which of the services we need to add. Excellent. All right. Well, we've, we've reached the end of this webinar. This has been great. I've learned a lot. Uh, I know the audience did as well. You know, you don't want to do hybrid cloud without Veeam. That's really what I, I took home from this event today. You know, it'd be like building a house without a hammer. Uh, it's an essential tool for hybrid cloud success. Sam and Leah, it's been great having you on. Thank you so much. Thanks again, David. And Thank thanks you, to everyone for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you to everyone out there in the audience. Uh, before we go, I do want to announce the winner of our Amazon $250 gift card. This is going to Corey Sales from Oklahoma. Congratulations, Corey Sales from Oklahoma. We'll reach out to you and we'll also be reaching out to our best question prize winner as well. I hope that you learned a lot. I hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.